Um, it's really exciting to uh, go to this session where um, we're launching the first major flagship report for the Academy. Geoffrey Braithwaite, in his really exciting session, gave us the challenge as an Academy. Uh, how are we going to work to improve the health system by 2030? Well, here it is, Geoffrey, number one step. And you have been part of this uh, amazing group that have put this together. Um, I'm really um, thrilled to introduce Chris Mitchell here. Chris has been the chair of this Academy's project. And this looks in detail uh, in how we can get Australia to deliver better health outcomes by in better embedding research and innovation in the health system. We don't do it anywhere near as well as we should. And these, this is really starting to map the path forward. Um, and this work has been uh, the fruit of about 18 months of hard labor, uh, which Chris chaired. You'll hear it's a huge project. And I hope you have a copy in your hand. Uh, and now um, I'm very excited to introduce Professor Christina Mitchell, who is Academic Vice President and Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences at Monash University, my alma mater. Chris. Thanks so much, Ingrid. And um, thank you for the opportunity to present the um, committee's work present to you today a summary of the uh, Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences first policy report on uh, research and innovation as core function in, in transforming the health system. So the um, report is the uh, a result of 18 months work by a committee that uh, looked to um, bring together the results of work where the Academy asked itself, how can we embed research more in the health system and why would we want to? So the committee collectively addressed the challenge. Sorry. The committee addressed the challenge of how do we embed research into the healthcare system and what would be the outcomes if we did? So the council asked and set the following terms of reference is to actually look at the national and international evidence on the value of integrating research into the health system to the mutual advantage, both for the healthcare system itself and also for the research sector to inform the Academy on the position, to map the current stakeholders' responsibilities, and also to think about the current landscape, what are the blockers, what are the drivers of uh, developing and integrating and translating research. And finally, to map the stakeholders and to deliver the Academy's vision, including the priorities and timelines for actually doing that. So the working group membership is here. It was a, a wide-ranging uh, research group, including um, CEOs of major public health services, public health researchers, health services researchers, um, uh, representing from um, both allied health, nursing, um, and from biodiscovery through to clinical translational research. So to develop... Um, both evidence and policy, it was a very wide-ranging data collection exercise from more than 260 people, including multiple roundtable interviews and discussions with senior healthcare administrators, early career researchers, mid-career researchers. Um, we also got involvement from um, members of academic health science committees, uh, the medtech sector, industry, healthcare consumers, First Nations researchers, and we also spoke to international experts and also gathered international evidence. Um, the uh, also was extensive analysis of the literature, and there was also an open survey for all to contribute. And then there was numerous meetings. <laughs> so, 
So what we heard. So we heard from consumers, through to researchers, through to clinicians, to the CEOs, that we do have a wonderful health care system. But we still have a lot of problems, which we heard in the previous session. We heard that we have uh, an outstanding biomedical and medical research sector. However, to tackle many of the problems and issues that we heard in the previous session, what is the value of embedding more research into that healthcare system, whether it's in general practice, whether it's in public health, whether it's in the major public hospitals? We heard from uh, the people who participated that we need an organisational culture, wherever it is in the healthcare system, that values research and innovation. Better integration is needed, and we recognise we have a very fragmented system. A fragmented system not only includes the fact that the federal government funds aged care and general practice, whereas the state governments fund major public hospitals. We have a medical research sector that's funded by the NHMRC, um, the MRFF, trusts and foundations, and we have various lobby groups from uh, Research Australia to the G of 8 Medical Deans to the institutes. Um, so it's, it is fragmented. It's excellent, but it's still fragmented. Can we bring it more together to get the best out of both in a regulatory process? So we heard that everybody from all those 260 and multiple sectors wants to integrate both research, academia and industry more closely together. The other thing that we heard uh, repetitively that clinician researchers are central to driving culture change, uh, but whether they be clinician researchers, surgeons, or public health physicians, or nurses, or allied health, the uh, clinician researcher can drive culture change. However, for medical researchers, and in particular for clinician researchers, it's a very complex path um, to get to uh, the end game of actually practising as a clinician researcher in the system. And um, finally, that Australia has enough resources and is investing in health enough and is investing in medical research, probably enough, uh, at, but how do we bring them together? So here's some examples of some of the quotes and that we have, that we heard, and they're dotted throughout the report, and I'll give you a, a second to read those. Um, I know you're all fast readers, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> and you can read them in the report. We also did uh, extensive literature reviews and um, some of the evidence that Jeffrey, who was on the committee, uh, presented earlier in the previous session. Um, we used evidence from his report and other reports. The international evidence and the data suggests that research-rich environments are better for both patients and staff. The evidence shows overwhelmingly that the quality of care is higher, there is less low-value care, there is reduced mortality, there's more efficient uptake of new innovations and, and faster implementation of new and best practice, the patients have a better experience and the staff are happier and they're more likely to stay in the system. What I found interesting was that we know that we've got major academic um, uh, medical research institutes and universities and major academic hospitals, but the benefits of that research being embedded in the health system extends beyond those major academic centres and influences non-academic centres and smaller regional hospitals because and it's not entirely clear why this is the case, but it actually extends beyond the population involved in the study. Uh, and we think it's probably that it's enabling um, evidence-based practice to be rolled out more quickly and to be better recognised. So the effects of embedding research in health systems are not restric restricted to academic or university-affiliated services, and um, they occur across a wide range of specialties and disease areas. So I guess the key messages is we face a lot of challenges with health. Uh, it's complex. We have a very 
heavy burden of disease in mental health, aged care, and complex and chronic diseases, and the health system is under pressure. If we embed research and innovation at the heart of our health system, we'll get better outcomes for Australian community, and we are more likely to have a more resilient system that delivers cutting edge care that is evidence based and will enable Australia to rise to the healthcare challenges as we saw during COVID. And we can maximise the efficient use of the existing resources. Um, we feel the report is um, not just for researchers, it's not just for the government, but it's for all of us who um, conduct research or our users in the health service and system. So I'm just going to present a summary of the 100-page-plus report. It has um, 14 major rec recommendations with five priorities, and the vision is that a system and culture that embeds research and innovation uh, is a core function of the health system. Pillar one is a skilled workforce, uh, which is a clinician researcher workforce. Pillar two, and I'll go into more detail of these uh, in the next few slides, is that we need targeted funding for research and innovation that embeds research in the health system. Pillar three is that we need more community and consumer involvement. And pillar four is we need to integrate better both academia, industry and research together with healthcare executives and actually with the system. We propose a three-year plan for implementation in these five priority areas and the 14 recommendations. So I'll just briefly go through the recommendations and we can explore them in more detail with the panel. So the overarching recommendation, and we had extensive discussion about this, is our system is by its structural nature fragmented with federal funding for GP and aged care, with state funding for major public hospitals, with various funding schemes for researchers, we need to have a venue or a mechanism to get everybody together in the room. Um, and so we are proposing as our overarching recommendation that Australian government, state and territory, medical research institutes, universities, healthcare system, general practice, public health, we need to have an overarching alliance that brings people into the room to discuss the issues and to come up with recommendations um, to bring the key partners together to enable collective thinking and working towards the aim of embedding research better into the health system. It doesn't have to be physically in the health system, but it needs to be actively engaged in the health system. And as we heard in the previous session, the challenges that the community and the health system are facing. So pillar one is the skilled enabled workforce. We heard over and over again that a clinician researcher is vulnerable. We don't even know how many we've got in this country. There's no mechanism for tracking them. We recognise that we have skilled clinician physicians and surgeons and obstetricians. We are short, I think, on, and you'll hear from Caroline, and I'll question her closely about this, that we are short of a skilled clinician researcher workforce in nursing and also in allied health, and they're not well recognised. We have to build that workforce. And that the uh, pathway for the clinician researcher is challenging. They need to maintain their clinical service, they need to get grants, they need to pay their salary. It's a very complex pathway for these researchers, but they are essential for us to deliver on our aims to improve healthcare. Pillar two is that we need to have targeted funding for research and innovation. The committee tried really, really hard to find out where all the money is. Where is all the money for research? We asked Ewan and he told us, don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to the feds, we had EOIs, we went to the states to try and find out, was there any hidden pots of money that we didn't know. We spoke to McKeon and also to people who were on the McKeon Review who tried to do the same thing. It is not clear where all the money is and where it all, go, all goes. Uh, it's not clear where all the clinician researchers are and how many we have. So um, it is a challenge. We're not fundamentally asking for more money except for the NHMRC, which has had a 
decrease in real terms in funding over its past decade. But we're asking for better coordination between NHMRC and MRFF, which MRFF is a wonderful scheme. There has been talk in the sector that perhaps it's not treating the addressing the burden of disease and the goals and strategy and priorities of the field. So there, was a, there, there is, was a general sense by the committee and a recommendation that they should work more closely together. So um, the recommendation after extensive discussion um, and failing to find all the money was that the Australian, we should get the funds together and to establish closer links between the NHMRC and MRFF and a call for increased funding for the NHMRC. Pillar three was one that the committee was unanimous about and we heard a lot of feedback and there is an enormous community support for medical research and biomedical research. The community is very proud of its health system but it wants to have more say and we need to involve the consumer and community involvement more in research particularly as we try to address the health, health needs of our community. And so we need to develop a framework to develop and improve and broader consumer involvement. And finally, pillar four is to how do we get industry, the health services, researchers, clinicians together? And we have had a vehicle for doing that, which has been intermittently funded and has been intermittently successful, which is NHMRC accredited research translation cent centres. And one of the reasons why these have been a challenge is because they've only been intimately funded. They're very large structures to put together. They are a vehicle for getting medical research institutes, health services, CEOs, medical researchers, universities together. A lot of them include our primary care, which is a big strength of the academic health science centres, to actually get them together and get them funded so they can actually operate on a sustained fashion. So that is the report in a nutshell. I am now going to ask um, the panel to come up and address your and other questions. And I will ask for the lights to come on and I'll ask the panel members to come up. So I might start the introductions. We have an absolutely star-studded cast here today. And I will start on my far right. We have Professor Sandra Eads, who is a member of the committee that formed the report. Um, Sandra is the Associate Dean Indigenous and Professor in the Centre of Epidemiology and Biostats at the University of Melbourne. She completed a medical degree and in 2003 she became Australia's first Aboriginal medical doctor to be awarded a PhD. She is a member of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences and was instrumental in the delivery of this report. Next is Professor Ewan Wallace, who is holds many hats, Ewan. <laughs> He's secretary for the Department of Health in Victoria. He's also one of Australia's leading clinician academics in obstetrics and gynaecology. He's a member of this academy. He was the inaugural CEO of SaferCare Victoria, um, the state's lead agency for healthcare quality and safety before becoming uh, secretary to the Department of Health. Next is Professor Steve Webb, who's a senior staff specialist in intensive care medicine at Royal Perth Hospital. He's also a clinical professor at both University of Western Australia and Monash University, for which Monash University is very grateful, Steve. He is a, a rock star clinician scientist who was the leader of the Australian Clinical Trial of the Year, the remap CAP platform trial, the report of the treatment of effective multiple different interventions for patients with severe COVID-19 infection. And I think one of the things that Steve and his team did was to rapidly incorporate these into clinical practice and international guidelines. And finally, but by no means least, Professor Caroline Homer, who has just been awarded an investigator grant. Congratulations, Caroline, that's the most important thing. <laughs> who is uh, a leading midwifery researcher. She's a member of the Burnett Executive Team, co-program director of maternal, child and adolescent health. And she's also currently chair of the NHMRC Council and deputy chair of the Australian Medical Research Advisory Council. So I might just kick off um, by asking each panel member to um, basically um, answer a couple of questions. First of all, 
maybe starting with Caroline, to talk about your personal experience and what you think will be the benefits of aligning healthcare delivery more closely with research and innovation. Uh, thank you, Chris, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say that it's really exciting to have this report from the Academy. I think it's a really important landmark document, and I'm a bit hazardous saying that given Jeffrey's comment earlier about no more reports, now we just need action. Yeah. Here we are delivering just another one. But maybe this is the last one before we can do action. Um, my own experience as a midwife is I really wanted to be a clinician researcher. I worked in a hospital, at St George Hospital in Sydney for many years and really wanted to transition into doing both research and clinical practice. And ultimately, it was too hard. The systems and the structures, particularly for midwives and nurses, just weren't there. And they frankly didn't know what to do with me. And when I eventually went into the university sector and tried to come back into the hospital sector, the only way I could do it was on a casual pool as a casual midwife um, and do the odd shift here and there. And they really had no concept that a non-medical workforce, so nursing midwifery allied health, could contribute in a way to do research in the clinical space that made a difference. And so ever since then, and that's 15 years ago, I've been determined that there has to be a better way and that we have to think about the structures and processes in our health systems, and this is hospitals and primary care, to make sure that the whole workforce can contribute as clinician scientists. Nurses and midwives make up 50% of the health workforce. We don't make up 50% of the clinician researcher workforce. And so we're wasting a whole bunch of really clever talent and a whole bunch of people who are at the coalface every day with patients and want to make a difference to patient care. So I think getting rid of roadblocks, and we've identified some of those roadblocks in the document and in the report, uh, valuing research at all levels, valuing the contribution, the unique contribution that all the different players bring to the table and ensuring that the, the whole of the workforce can contribute and the whole of the workforce can make a difference. Because as we've shown in the report, the evidence is that when you embed research into healthcare, you get a difference in patient outcomes. And one last thing that I'll say is that, I know Ewan's going to touch on this as well, is that we've got a health workforce uh, desperate position at the moment. We've had our health workers live through two and a half, nearly three years of COVID. They're tired, they're exhausted, they're leaving in droves. And in my disciplines, in nursing and midwifery, they're really leaving in droves. And we can't get enough back. We've trained them easily, but we kill them off pretty quickly when they hit the sector. We can't do that anymore. We can't, we can't afford that. So if there's a research career pathway, if there's somewhere for people to go, if there's something new and exciting to be involved in and to be valued for, then I think that's a recruitment and retention strategy. And we absolutely need that for the whole clinician workforce. Thanks, Thanks Caroline. Chris. Steve. Steve, you've actually done it in your REMAC CAP trial. How, did, how were you so nimble? How could you react so quickly and get it embedded and out? Was that because you were in the healthcare system? Was it because where you were, it was embedded? Uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about how you delivered the first trial for Australia. So, so the E in REMAP is embedded. Uh, and REMAP CAP's an um, adaptive platform trial that was designed to be um, integrated as a substitute for routine patient care. Um, so it, it was um, a, a trial for patients with community-acquired pneumonia that uh, started in 2016, but it was always designed so that it could adapt in the event of a respiratory pandemic. We had no idea if one was going to turn up, uh, but we were able to adapt when uh, one did. Um, but intensive care units are a 24-7 uh, location, and you want patients uh, to be enrolled as soon as possible uh, in a clinical trial. You want as much as possible the clinical trial activities to accurately um, uh, reproduce the timing of the clinical decision making um, that is being evaluated in the trial. And so what that means is taking advantage of the clinical workforce to undertake uh, screening and recruitment. 
um, we use an online um, eligibility system which only asks the sort of questions that a resident or registrar in the ICU should be able to answer about their patients. It takes five minutes to answer those questions and then the patient is um, evaluated in terms of their eligibility and they're randomised. We then abandon one of the traditional tenets of randomised controlled trials which is blinding and we just utilise the clinicians delivering open label the treatments um, uh, that are being provided to the, to the patients. So often that's no more complicated than, than writing up a drug and following a one page administration guide that's printed and available at the edge of the bedside to follow through the patient course to ensure that the um, assigned treatment uh, is adhered to. And then it's not necessarily strictly part of embedding, but we try to be extremely ruthless and pars parsimonious with the amount of data that needs to be collected. So we're only collecting that data that's easily available and um, uh, is critical to determining uh, outcome. But what that does is that creates an efficient system and through that process, um, it's only employed professional research staff, research coordinators, who are collecting the outcome data. Um, and um, uh, this, one, of the, one of the things which is absolutely crucial for successful embedding is that uh, research activities are designed by or, or at least involve bedside clinicians. Uh, we've got a history of doing embedded trials that goes back 20 years in intensive care and if the processes that you're using to try and embed are going to interfere with routine clinical flow or take a long time uh, to achieve or they make the life of clinicians uh, harder and more difficult, then um, uh, those methods uh, don't work. So there's a lot of sort of um, culture and accumulated knowledge about how you uh, go about implementing um, the research activity so that it has minimum adverse impact on the clinical flow and the clinical workforce. Thanks, Steve. Ewan, I'm going to put you on the spot. You're running all of health in Victoria. Is, is the health uh, department interested and want to embed research in the Victorian health system? Is that better? Here we yep. go. Thanks. Um, we are, of course we're interested. Um, I mean, like Caroline, can I just begin by thanking the Academy and particularly the working group for an excellent report. I think, I, I don't, at least in the Australian context, I don't think I've seen the why so clearly uh, enunciated as in this report. And I think there are more whys and um, much of the patient safety improvements, the quality, the efficiencies um, of academic health centres, you know, where, where hospitals where research is embedded, may, may in part be due to some of the issues that Caroline brought up. Actually, you have a happier workforce. There's a completely separate literature on, if you've got a happy um, healthcare workforce, your patient outcomes are better and your hospital costs are lower. Um, and I think there is a lever that has arrived squarely on government's doorsteps, which is we've got a huge workforce cliff that we're facing and are one of the solutions to that to make jobs much more attractive um, and deliver and having research components of our roles um, is central to that. If, if you ask clinicians what are the what are the best things of your job, they say patient care and research is number two. Yeah? And then all the other stuff that we have asked clinicians to do, particularly electronic medical records, the work of the devil, um, <laughs> you know, administration has taken over the lives. Yeah of our health workforce and actually um, embedding research to make jobs more attractive, more enjoyable, to bring joy back to what's a tough industry, right? Um, actually is a lever that we shouldn't miss and I think we should continue to drive our arguments as well as all the other patient safety efficiencies. Um, so we are interested. I, I, the, 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 the how is going to be the challenge and I just add one thing to what Jeffrey said this morning, and actually because Steve has just touched upon it. Um, not only does it take too long to implement evidence, but it takes too long and it's too expensive to generate the evidence. The, the industry that has become clinical trials, frankly, is outrageous. Uh, and I think the ICU clinical network is an exemplar in how to deliver clinical trials efficiently, effectively, that, as Steve says, don't disrupt normal patient care. Because once you start doing that, it's dead in the water. 
Interesting. Uh, what do you think the political situation is? Are our political leaders interested in embedding research more in healthcare? You, you see them more than we do. Yeah, well, I think, I think what political leaders, um, and again, Jeffy talk, touched upon this this morning, what the political leaders are clearly facing um, is a um, stark realisation that we have an un we're on an unsustainable growth trajectory in health expenditure. Ten years ago, we spent about nine, nine and a bit percent of GDP. We're now ten and a quarter percent GDP. The states, for all the reasons, that, that, you know, for all the wrongs of the US healthcare system, are 20 percent. Um, um, we're middle of the pack for OECD, but, but, but we're still on a trajectory that's not sustainable. If, if research and better embedding research in healthcare provision um, at least slows the trajectory, then of course governments are going to be interested. Thank you. Sandra, maybe you could give us some of your personal experiences where you have felt that aligning healthcare delivery more closely with research and innovation has, has worked in your experience of, uh, as, a, as a researcher and a clinician. There's a great example in the report, actually. Christina, the team have pulled that out. A beautiful study by Sue Kildear and um, Yvette Rowe in Queensland. Fiona Stanley's here. We spent decades thinking about low birth weight and preterm births in Aboriginal babies, how to reduce them, get them below 10 or 12 per cent. And the number of papers I read about that, and they, they've, they conducted this beautiful NH and MRC study where they uh, had two systems of care. One that, Im that involved Aboriginal people in the governance of that system of care and involved Aboriginal workers in that system of care. Um, and that's in Queensland hospitals in partnership with Aboriginal community controlled health services. And they reduce by almost 50% the rate of preterm births. So what I think in my mind is the really nice thing about that was that was that was not research out in the community. That was researchers embedded in the health system, looking at a complex health problem for Aboriginal people and finding a way to solve it. And the question is now, what are we doing about scaling up and trying to ensure that that is integrated at a systems level across different states and territories? that Aboriginal involvement in governance and control and the involvement of Aboriginal health workers. Um, people obviously felt safe and they attended, women attended that service. It goes to the issues of cultural safety, racism, um, tackling and improving the quality of the system for Aboriginal people. Wendy Hoy, back in the 1990s, was the first person to rattle the can about not implementing the evidence we know for Aboriginal people, untreated blood pressure, hypertension, and the whole chronic disease care models that, that originated out of the Northern Territory and, you know, that's been one of the massive successes. The thing we really did was reduce deaths from cardiovascular disease for Aboriginal people. That is the standout success and that was public health and improved primary care. So. You know, all of the, I feel optimistic that all of the effort, all of the investments, the new investments since 2002 are paying off. Um, but like the first session alluded to, there are structural issues as well as, um, you know, the quality of our health system, embedding health research into the health system. I looked at some data from our adolescent cohort study recently from a couple of PhD students one looking at um, healthy body weight and the other looking at physical activity. And between 10 and 14, 70% um, of our cohort had a healthy body weight. And between 20 and 24, 30% of our cohort had a healthy body weight. And what really drove healthy body weight was an engagement in physical activity, belonging to a sporting club. You know, it overcame the cost barrier, an Aboriginal sporting club, and I thought, we're all literate about Aboriginal com community controlled health services, but those non-health sis setting systems that we need to integrate with the health setting and, and research that, you know, research in the health system, but research outside of the health, that integration of systems is really important. Yes. Sandra? Uh, 
I might just give the panel one more round of questions and then we'll open um, to the audience for questions. So, um, Caroline, I'm going to put you on the spot as uh, Chair of Council of NHMRC. Uh, you on the committee with all of us proposed that we should have an overarching alliance because the system's too fragmented so that the NHMRC comes together with MRFF, comes together with health, federal, state. H how do you think that will work? Do you think we can implement that? And what would you do about implementing it? Uh, I do. Th I do think we need um, we need to bring everybody together. I think if you look in the report, the amount of different players there are, and NHMRC and MRFF are the two big ones. But state and territory governments all produce research, give out grants. Uh, the non-government organisations, the charity sector, it's enormous. When we actually trawled through and tried to find where is all the money and who is all coming from, yes, we couldn't find it, but we know that there's a lot of players. So I do think some alliance, some way of bringing people together and having common goals going forward. And so you're right, Chris, we have recommended an alliance and I am in support of that, whatever it's ultimately called, but I do think we need to have some mechanism to bring everybody together. Um, we also do need more funding for NH and MRC, there's, there's no doubt, and I'm not a public servant, so I'm allowed to lobby for more money. Um, and, you know, when you look in the report, the, the, the numbers have gone down when you think about um, the other increases. We know that every grant now is more expensive than it was five years ago, ten years ago. So the amount of grants that can be funded with the same envelope of money has gone down. And so we do see that in, in um, funded rates over all of the schemes. So, so we do need more money, but we do need to come together. At the moment, there are reasonably unmechanistic mechanisms, that's a stupid way to put it, but, you know, reasonably unstructured ways that we bring MRFF and NH and MRC together. Mostly it's through myself and uh, Ian Fraser, who's here, and we're on both committees, and Anne Kelso sits on, obviously, on council as uh, the CEO, and then she's an ex officio member of AMRAB. But that's not enough. That, that's, that's not... That's not a system. That's a few individuals who will do their best and will try really hard. Um, but we need we need a better mechanism, I think, to bring all those groups together so that we spend the dollars we have. And especially if we don't get more dollars, we need to spend it all more wisely and more cleverly um, so that better outcomes for the Australian population. Thanks, Caroline. Great answer. Steve, I'm going to put you on the spot. You're now in charge of the whole thing and you're in charge of implementation. So what would you, what are the next step, steps in implementing embedding research and innovation? What would you do next? Um, uh, uh, I'm not, well, let me um, <laughs> struggle to uh, respond with, a, um, um, with some uh, coherence. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna go on a slightly different journey. Uh, Chris. Go for it. Um, healthcare is a knowledge-based industry. I think we would all uh, accept that. There's lots of other knowledge-based uh, industries, uh, pharmaceuticals, software, computers, um, uh, even uh, making cars is a knowledge-based industry. In each of those industries, there's a sweet spot for the proportion of revenue, of turnover, that goes back into uh, research and development. In pharmaceuticals, it's about 20% of turnover goes back into designing new drugs. For software and computing, it's about 10 to 15%, um, and even Volkswagen spends 5% of turnover trying to um, not cheat the tests and design uh, better cars. Um, my best estimate is it's probably about 0.1% of healthcare expenditure goes back into um, direct research and innovation to improve the healthcare sector. Now, I don't know where the sweet spot is, but I'm pretty sure it's not 0.1%. And I think I'm a big believer in evidence, and what I'd like to see us do is have the sort of thing that um, um, uh, Russ Gruen was talking about of exemplar projects where we um, actually try and um, uh, embed across an entire health care uh, delivery system, embedded research, and we work out how much better we make people's lives, and critically, how much we either save money or at least bend the unsustainable um, in, uh, healthcare inflation. And that provides a rationale for determining um, the right level of expenditure and the right sorts of models. Thanks, Steve. Great answer. Ewan. How do we make research 
an expected part of healthcare. How do we say this is your KPI? You, as the Secretary of Department of Health, you set the KPIs. If you did that, or do you do that? Yes, yeah, so I mean, that, well, so um, those from interstate and uh, Victorian health services have a statement of priorities that, um, that they're issued each year, um, which defines the um, outcomes, if you like, or outputs of the health service. Uh, all, uh, all jurisdictions um, in Australia have similar approaches. Um, research outcomes don't feature on that list. Now, that's not to say, and you um, alluded to earlier today, that's not to say that um, Australian host public hospitals don't um, get funding for um, for research. Em not to look for embedded <laughs> embedded in their funding formulas are a moiety of funding. On I mean, in Victoria, it's bundled into a teaching, training, and research bundle. And um, go to Steve's point, it's about one and a half percent. Um, but there are no deliverable KPIs for those. So you're not going to set KPIs? Well, it's something that we're very interested in looking at. Clearly, um, we're, I mean, I, I think, could we do what um, UK did, you know, under um, Sally Davies and others? Um, I'm not sure we could, but I, th I think that's the right direction. I think, like most things, I mean, Again, we don't we don't have visibility. You said in your introductory comments, we don't have visibility of how many clinician researchers we've got in the system. I mean, the academy should embark on that piece of work, report to us as a nation by jurisdiction how many clinician clinician researchers do we have in our system. Um, similarly, for research outcomes, um, I, 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 we should be collecting data and reporting on it in in the first instance and then use that to be able to derive some benchmarkable applicable um, outcomes in their statement of expectation statement of priorities for our health services we don't have the data that there are some inherent risks in that and as you know from our previous conversations at least in victoria i'm sure this is the same in, in our sister states and territories um some of our key challenges in healthcare quality and delivery are in regional and rural settings. And there are some very important lessons to learn from what the UK did. We do not want to denude funding from the places that need it most. And it goes to the, I was very pleased to see the word cloud with um, equitable system um, center. Um, to, to deliver an equitable system in Victoria will necessarily require more investment per capita in our regional cities and rural towns than we currently do. Um, so we have to have that running in parallel with some sort of research output KPI-based funding. And um, you can see the dangers in that because if you, um, if you overcook the latter, um, you'll see centralizing of funding into um, our met metro precincts. Um, so, but are we interested? Of course we're interested because um, we want to be able to identify um, where do we get the best bang for our buck. Thank you. And that's a very nice segue for my next question to Sandra. We've heard that the greatest areas of need for research are in primary care. Us, you know, it's a small sector, rural and regional settings. How do we as an academy and how do we as researchers address that need? What structural reforms are needed in terms of funding from NHMRC, MRFF, from the healthcare system to actually improve uh, that dimension in rural and regional care? Um, I, I always think when we place priority on those areas and we, you know, we have affirmative action, we had affirmative action for Indigenous health. Really what's happened since 2002, all of the effort, the intensification of the effort, the, the increase in the investment has really paid off and it's helped transform the way evidence-driven healthcare operates in Indigenous settings. I think we need to do the same for general practice. We can't sit on the sidelines when we have the debates about the crisis in primary care. We actually, as an academy, have to take a position on difficult issues and voice that position, even if it might be politically unpalatable. Um, so, you know, entering the fray and supporting primary care and general practice because you kind of have research in primary care if you don't have primary care. So, <laughs> um, and, 
you know, a lot of the debate currently is about is about that. I think I think regionalising, I've listened to you and I was in Shepparton yesterday at an Aboriginal health conference. We can regionalise and we can connect, you know, centres of excellence in, you know, the University of Melbourne to a precinct in Shepparton. I was recently the Dean of Medicine at Curtin. We were working to strengthen our precinct in Kalgoorlie. We can have connections, so I think it would be an incredible waste of effort if we supported the academic health science centres and we, we, we pulled levers that, you know, had the reverse impact, you know, drove the investment and the effort and the focus into cities and neglected rural settings. That would be a pro big problem. Yeah. Thanks. Um, we are now open for questions from the audience. Eric. Thanks, uh, Eric Moran, uh, clinician scientist from Monash University. Uh, the, the report is excellent and it is beautiful to see it all in one place, but uh, it's going to take a political will at the highest level to make these changes. So the question I have for the panel and I guess for the academy is what's the strategy for making politicians care? They do want to do good, but they also want to get votes. So how do you craft a strategy that gives them both those things? Anyone want to volunteer to answer that? Uh, well, we could invite them to our meetings. I was at the Population Health Congress in Adelaide a few weeks ago and there were two federal ministers, um, one ex, one current, I think, who were part of the agenda and part of the discussion. The question about stage three tax cuts came up as a, and we, we could actually get a response. You know, increasing engagement with politicians, I think, is perhaps an area where we can improve our meetings and our systems of influence and not just feel we need to fly to Canberra, but we can in involve them in these debates. Dee, um, and then the, Caroline. The, the, the advice that um, I'd always received about trying to influence um, uh, politicians is you, want to, you need to solve their problems. So you need to put yourself in their shoes. And uh, at least in the treasuries, in the jurisdictions, in the federal government, it's, it's expansion in the healthcare budget which keeps them uh, awake at night. I think we should be seeking to sell this um, as a way of um, uh, bending that cost curve. Caroline? And I guess to add to that, um, we need to partner with consumers who are their, you know, we're, we're voters, of course, but... Um, they're going to be the ultimate voters as well. And in my experience of lobbying for change in maternity services, no one cared when I went to see a politician, but when I took a bunch of women with prams, it made a really big difference. <laughs> um, so, you know, we've got great consumer engagement. We, we have to, the Academy really should, I hate saying that, but we will and we must um, partner with all those consumer advocates out there because they are the voices that will make a change. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Peter, and then two over here. Here first. Front lady in red. Apologies. Go ahead. Oh, thank sorry, you very Fiona. much. Yep. Okay. Yep. Fiona Stanley here. Um, I may be a bit naive. I think this is a great report too, and I really commend you on it. Um, but the... I may be a bit naive in thinking that one of the biggest problems we have, and we're going to be addressing this in the next session, is the inequity. And that inequity isn't just coming from a, a, a very heavily, wonderfully researched group in Melbourne and the, the remote's not getting, or re regional, not getting that research and having that flow through, although you did make the point that it did. But I'm just wondering as well how fee-for-service and private care is going to be a big barrier. And I really, really feel this more and more um, COVID exposed that privatisation was actually devastating for things like aged care and childcare. And I just wonder if um, you made the point that we're you and that we're going perhaps towards America. And I think we are. And that surely, I mean, what's going to be the, who's going to take the evidence and the research or are they going to charge? And I, that really worries me. Yep. Um, and uh, so I, I want some comment on that because it seems to me that's going to be one of our biggest barriers. And I just want to make another comment rather than a question. And that is that um, I've, I've been supporting Julian Elliott's um, 
Australian Living Evidence Consortium, um, and that's another way in which um, you would be knowing about that, Steve, <laughs> since you're in it. Um, we can get rapid translation of evidence into healthcare, and that's the issue because the NHMRC guidelines out of date when they're published. It takes Cochrane collaboration several years to do systematic reviews. We've got an almost ability to do this in real time with the kind of methodology that Julian's produced. He's at uh, Monash, but that was Thank just you. a comment. Thank you. Ewan, do you want to answer that? Um, well, I agree with Fiona on the equity issue, and it's not just about metro and rural regional. Of course, we've got profound pockets of inequity in, in, our, in our cities, yeah, in, in, including the city. And you're absolutely right, the pandemic made those much more visible and made them worse. And there are lots of lessons if, um, for us to learn from um, Michael Marmot's um, reviews about building back better. And if you haven't read those, largely public health-based, um, community health-based approaches to trying to address some of the inequities that have been worsened by the pandemic, then I'd commend um, Michael's reviews to you from the Institute of um, Public Policy Research in London. Um, uh, in, in our own um, government's um, uh, health um, um, operational plan, equity is centre um, of that. So a very clear commitment to addressing some of the inequities. Uh, and again, uh, the pandemic not just exposed, but but pointed us into the solutions. And uh, I think in Victoria, like elsewhere in Australia, some of our initial responses to the pandemic were blunted because we didn't have those trusted relationships with community that we have now built over two years. And I think of the um, Community Unity Immunity Program that we ran in Aboriginal Vaccine Program in, in Victoria with... Um, with um, um, community leaders, our elders, and poor Uncle Jack, who's no longer with us. But um, we, we've, the, our Aboriginal um, healthcare providers were able to deliver healthcare um, in a way through the pandemic. Um, that actually shows us the way, not just for them, for, for, for other communities that, that um, 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 have profound inequity. Um, in terms of the, can I just comment on the, um, I agree, I think the living evidence um, um, program has been really good. And it's something that's troubling me for a long time, long, long before this role. And again, I, I sort of alluded to it in my, my comments to the first question. This engine, this machinery of clinical trials and evidence and Cochrane and so on, it, it, it feels almost completely disconnected from healthcare delivery. And that's a problem for us. It's a problem for the academy. It's a problem for clinician researchers. It's a problem for those who distill and synthesize um, and represent evidence. Um, it feels a bit ethereal, to be honest. Um, and we need to find ways, as Fiona said, and um, as Jeffrey said this morning, to get though that to, to generate the evidence faster and more efficiently, um, and then to get it into practice quickly. And not just in the centers that generate the evidence, but in the, all the centres. And what, what, what the overarching message, and again, Jeff, Jeffrey delivered it this morning, it requires deep connectedness. Yeah? We don't have a health system today. Yeah? We, have, we have islands of healthcare providers. Okay. Yeah. Chris, can I just comment on um, uh, Fiona's question about um, implementation? And I think it also bears uh, relevance to Ewan's comments. Um, if, if the healthcare system uh, or if we uh, as part of the healthcare system are going to conduct embedded research, it has to be useful to the healthcare system. And what that means is the concept of implementability. And it means that uh, if it's relating to clinical trials, that they're designed to be conducted um, and reported in a way that the interventions will actually be delivered um, if they uh, were uh, identified um, as being effective. There's far too much much research, in my opinion, um, which is um, um, academic rather than uh, pragmatic. Um, it's not enough to know that a treatment works. You need to know that a treatment works in the way it's going to have to be delivered in practice. Yeah, good point. Can I, can I sorry, can I, I agree with Steve, but um, it, it, um, there's a tension here. There's a tension be, between um, doing research that is addressing key priorities um, of health challenges and making sure it's implementable, but also not um, completely cutting off the roots of discovery research. Um, and, you know, the, in, the, in the, you know, I mean, 
not, not everyone has good ideas, but a good idea can come from anywhere. Yes. Yeah? And, and we mustn't create a health funding system that extinguishes the opportunities of those good ideas. And I know that's not what you're saying, Steve, but, you know, it is a tension. Yep. Yep. Um, we're a little out of time. We've got time for two more questions. Peter? Yeah, I'd just like to commend you on the excellent report. And um, my question really follows on from Carolyn's comment about uh, clinician scientists adding value because um, I'm a clinician scientist at Monash University and in my department I have 43 clinician PhD students and I worry at night about how I'm going to support them in an academic career after they finish their PhD. And this requires a really strong partnership between the health service to provide sessions for that clinician as well as the university or other external sources in providing time for dedicated research. So in uh, sort of uh, getting this pathway uh, structure for their careers, we really need to get those strong partnerships between the health service and it's going to be very dependent on the individual health service and how much they believe in research or getting the academic health science centres to help drive that collaboration for it to be effective. So I think that's one of the challenges that we have. I agree completely. Any... Uh, maybe back there. Yes, Maggie, sorry. Gee, you have to fight pretty hard for a question. Yeah, it's, a tough, um, it's, a tough, it's a tough audience. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Margie Danch and I'm a paediatrician and vaccine researcher uh, from Murdoch Children's Research Institute and the Royal Children's Hospital. But I'm also the Director of Clinician Scientist Pathways at the Melbourne Medical School and just wanted to follow on from that comment. I think we've got a real problem with funding um, clinician scientist pathways and I think we need a national integrated, integrated approach. I mean, I, I think we all know different research institutes that do this well and we're fortunate here at MCRI that we have access to um, funding to be able to offer really comprehensive um, clinician scientist fellowships. Um, I'm fortunate to work with Sir John Saville across the MAC track and their beautiful bespoke five-year funded pathways where they have, you know, two years which are mostly um, clinical work with a bit of research and then a PhD in the middle but paid at a clinical salary because that is supported by the hospital. So there is a lot of innovation, I think, in how we can deliver clinician scientist pathways but there's no integrated approach and it's pillar one in your report. So I wonder what is the thinking around how you're going to approach this problem? Anyone got the answer? <laughs> I don't have the answer, but I think one of the... So one of the recommendations is we need to count them because what you can't count, you don't care about. So I think we have to work out a way of counting them and someone challenged the academy to do that, and yes. I think we should. Um, and then I think we need to explore what are the different models because I suspect even in this room there are half a dozen different ways of doing clinician scientists, whether it's, you know, Monash or MCRI or uh, in other states and territories, I'm sure there's other ways of doing it. So we kind of need a toolbox of the ways to do it because I also think that the health services don't, don't know what they... Well, they don't know what they don't know and they don't know what's possible. And if the hospital down the road is doing something, maybe they'll say, oh, we could possibly do that. We had Teresa Anderson from Sydney Local Health District on the working group and she was just brilliant around... Uh, you know, oh, I never thought of that, or we're doing this, but no one else is doing it. And I think, so enumerating who's out there and then describing what are the different ways and means to have clinician scientists. And there's not one size fits all. There's a lot of different ways we can do it. Thanks, Caroline. There was a question. I, I might just, Margie, I completely agree. I mean, I, I'm a beneficiary of exactly that. Um, when I did my um, clinical training and research training in Edinburgh, where John was at the time, um, there is an opportunity coming, particularly in nursing. So the, the, the country is about to embark on a nursing workforce plan. Um, and I think the academy and others, um, other obviously industry stakeholders, could and should be participating and contributing to that plan to ensure that embedded clinician researcher pathways are in our nursing workforce plan. Thank you. I think this will have to be the last question. Thank you, Sharon Field from the Australian National University. Um, I really, really enjoyed the discussion and the report, and I, I suppose I wanted to pick up on the, the title, so a vision for the future of health in Australia, um, and really to get the panel's reflections of how 
how the sort of the wider public health research feeds into the discussion that we've been having so far, which has been predominantly medical and biomedical. Uh, if if the vision is better health and health outcomes, then surely in the research mix we must bring in uh, research beyond uh, beyond the biomedical and the, the medical. And you know, we don't need to look to the UK for decades of evidence around the social determinants of health inequities. We have loads of that here in Australia. So I suppose just the reflection as to how we absolutely uh, include that wider public health research into a research programme coming out of the academy. Does anyone want to have a go at that one? It's a good question. Um, Simon? I, I think it's supported. I think yeah. the vexed issue has been the decline in clinician researchers, but um, amongst the fellowship of the academy, there's a healthy number of public health broader um, researchers who are not actively involved in day-to-day -day clinical care. I agree, sometimes we can be careful about our terminology, um, but I think uh, one of my earlier points was the uh, a, a learning, living health system with research embedded in it, but also the connections to other parts of society and research that integrates those things. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. I'd just like, on behalf of the Academy, to put our hands together to thank the panel members. I would like to thank everyone for their contribution, including online. Uh, the Academy will continue its work, and the report uh, is available, and uh, we're all going to be working on implementing it for the next three years, and Ingrid has a few final words to say. Um, really, I want to echo um, the thanks to Chris and the panellists and the working group members. Um, I'm sure we've whet your appetite, but this is just the executive summary. So go forth and read the other 70 pages, which I have done, and I think it's absolutely brilliant. The Academy is indeed in a prime position to take on many of the uh, issues raised by you and the panel, and uh, hopefully our online participants have been thinking about all these issues as well. And I think it's clear there are both systems and structural issues that need to be fixed, and we need to extend uh, this to the non-health systems. One of the passions of mine is around the clinician researchers, and we've got to start by counting. We need evidence, don't we? And I'm sure that the Academy is well-placed to take that forward, Catherine. Um, and uh, we really don't know how many we have, and that would help us to frame how to take it forward. And I, I think Margie's point is really important. We need a national way of doing this, not just Melbourne, not just the MAC, but or, or I know Monash is doing similar things, but we need it to be Australia-wide with many different ways to achieve these outcomes. So we have a happier and healthier workforce. And then the final issue, which I think is incredibly important, is implementation of research. And um, the Academy has a key role in, in that being the next step. So please join me in thanking Chris and everyone in the Academy, including the Secretariat, for bringing this project to fruition and for really outlining the way forward. Thank you.